Yeah. Yeah. Great. Goldie, uh, if you can do a quick check in, uh, you are uh, on. Oh yes, I'm on. Yeah. So oh, yes. Gold, Goldie, Goldie is our community manager in our coaching office. Goldie, if you Hello, can take Goldie, an action. Yeah. Uh, work with uh, Ranjini and Zakaria as well uh, uh, to closely work with them and uh, see how we can collaborate a lot more with QSAT in Cochin. Yeah, sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We will, we will ask for serious. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I think it is now it is the time. I think Ranjini, uh, ma'am, you'll start. Good, good afternoon again. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar of the month organized by the Duke Kaushal Kendra, Cochin University of Science and Technology. As we all know, this is part of the international webinar series we have been organizing since last October. So this happens to be the 12th edition of the international webinar series. So it's a milestone for us because uh, we have, uh, we are now completing one full year uh, since the start of this uh, initiative. So the webinar topic of the month is scaling up and global access for startups. As we all agree, as we all know, entrepreneurship is key to social and economic progress of countries. And India is a happening place in this particular context being one of the largest startup ecosystems in the world. However, the scaling up or uh, reaching out to the global market uh, have always been challenging for Indian startups. So therefore, I think uh, today's uh, topic of the uh, webinar is a very relevant one for all of us here, especially for our students. Uh, there are many aspiring students you know, who would like to um, you know, enter into this uh, field, you know, into the world of entrepreneurship and startups. So against that background, we are really happy to bring to you this particular session. And uh, we have got the right uh, resource person also for this particular topic. So, uh, so the, the speaker of the day is Mr. Irfan Malik. Uh, he's someone with, uh, you know, who has worked extensively in this particular domain for decades. So he's CEO and director of NQ Innovation uh, innovation Global, based in Sydney, Australia. He has also served as the president of the New South Wales chapter of uh, Australia India Business Council. And he has assumed uh, various leadership roles in large business and IT transformational change programs, uh, you know, taking the organizations to the strategic outcomes. And he has a wealth of experience in value-added digital and mobility business technology Good solutions, morning, bringing in industry best practices and global innovations. So we thank all of you for joining us today. And on behalf of everyone present on this call, and uh, did you Kaushal Kendra Kusat, I welcome Mr. Edfan Malik to the session. Thank you, sirs, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to listen to you. Let me also welcome Mr. Esad Nayar, who has been instrumental in making this happen. Welcome, sir. Let me also welcome Dr. Sakriya K, Director Didio Kaushal Kentra, the brain behind this international webinar series. So as we enter the 12th edition of this uh, international webinar series, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Um, and before me, we move on to the webinars and we have also have uh, Ms. Golti of, you know, he's a colleague of uh, Mr. Irfan Malik uh, from the Kochi office of NQ Innovations. So I would like to welcome uh, Ms. Golti also to this uh, call. And so before we move on to this webinar session, I invite Dr. Sekriya for delivering the opening remarks. Uh, Sekriya sir, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. Uh, respected Mr. Irfan Malik, Chief Executive Officer and Director in Q Innovation Global, Sydney, Australia. Sri Esar Nair, uh, members from uh, InQ Innovation.
National webinar series today uh, with our uh, 12th edition, where we have uh, an outstanding entrepreneur, Mr. Irfan Malik, is with us to deliver the valedictory webinar uh, today. See, when the pandemic affected uh, in their academic activity, the offline activities had a lot of constraints. So people confined uh, their activities within the walls of their departments. And a few people started conducting webinars and other online activities. So we thought instead of uh, simply organizing an ordinary webinar, we should organize something very unique and special. And that idea, that thought, uh, ended up with uh, starting an international webinar series. And it is not just a webinar. What we thought, we will try to get Indians who are excelling outstandingly elsewhere in, the, in, the, in, the, in other parts of the globe. So that their expertise can be made available to Indian community, especially the growing student community who are venturing into corporate world, venturing into entrepreneurship. So what we thought is we organize an international webinar series uh, focusing on technology management and entrepreneurship. So we try to get outstanding people, Indians working different parts of the globe, excel well in their domains, and people from corporate, people from academia, and people from entrepreneurship domain all came over. And this is the 12th edition of the webinar. So just having a quick glance of the webinar series, we started it in 22nd October 2020, where we had uh, Mr. Pierre Rajshegrin, Head of Sales and Services, Wayfair Europe, and who was a former director of McKinsey, who was the first speaker in the series. And second, second webinar was on business analytics, emerging career opportunities, was delivered by Dr. Anup Nandilat from University of Wisconsin. He is an associate professor there. Then uh, the third edition was uh, on analytics in financial planning and analysis, delivered by Mrs. Ritu Sharma, senior director, controlling and systems of Electrolux, Sweden. Fourth one was by Dr. Babu George, uh, a Keralite uh, who is a professor and associate dean at the School of Business of Christian Brothers University, USA. It was on digital transformation of higher education, equity, and inclusion. And fifth one was on resilient supply chain. One of my senior uh, who did MBA in my department, Dr. Sunil Sahadev, he joined from UK. He is a professor of marketing and uh, responsible enterprise uh, in the Indian Business School, UK. And sixth one was by uh, sixth one was uh, on rigor in qualitative research by Dr. Dilip, uh, who is a director of strategy and research, uh, NFCT Malaysia, and a professor Unis Netherlands. And seventh one was uh, by Dr. Justin Paul, who is an outstanding scholar and professor. He inspired the young researchers by talking about publishing in high impact journals its do's and don'ts. And next one was the eighth one that was by Mahin Gobal, who is a solution advisor at SAP, Delaware, USA. And he talked about ERP as an enabler of digital transformation. And ninth one was on B2B commerce beyond selling by Mr. Jiji Kereke Chetipura. Uh, he is an e-commerce strategist. Uh, he joined from Bettina, USA. And 10th one was on sustainable innovations at the grassroots. This is by Mrs. Sandeep Pandey, uh, who is also a strategic leader, uh, currently associated with uh, Stanford University for his leads program. Then the last program, last webinar, the 11th edition was uh, uh, by Mr. Sudhir Venugopal, a successful serial entrepreneur from UAE, who talked about ABCD of entrepreneurship. And today, the 12th edition, that is the concluding session, is on scaling up and global market access for startups. We have another Indian uh, expert who has excelled well. Even last week when we were interacting, he was totally busy with organizing some global events. So very energetic, dynamic, young uh, person with us to deliver on uh, entrepreneurship, especially on scaling up. And uh, we have great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Irfan Malik for uh, this uh, concluding webinar. 
So we are honored that you have agreed to deliver this valedictory webinar series, this international webinar series. So thank you very much, sir. With these words, uh, I invite you to deliver your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zaka. Uh, greetings uh, from Sydney, Australia to all of you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Renjini, for the intro as well. But I must uh, uh, you know, my, express my heartfelt th thanks to uh, Sar Nayarji, uh, who obviously connected us all again, and someone I have a lot of respect, uh, and we share a pa passion for creating impactful uh, outcomes, not only in the startup, but innovation, and essentially impactful businesses as well. So thank you, Dr. Nayarji, as well. Um, and, and also want to acknowledge uh, and recognize uh, that I've got my uh, director partner, Dilip Ibrahim, uh, who heads in queue in India, who's based out of Bangalore and Cochin, but currently in Bangalore, and Goldie, uh, who uh, is the community manager in our Cochin office, which is in Pala Rivartam. Um, thank you all for coming on board, but also most importantly, thanking all of uh, uh, the students and uh, startup uh, founders, co-founders, or startup uh, entrepreneurial aspirants as well. Uh, welcome again, and I look forward to having this not as a lecture, but more an insightful uh, conversation uh, and trying to tell a bit of a story as well uh, of uh, you know how my journey uh, and also the InQ journey and what we do and what uh, we kind of shaped as well. Um, but uh, before that, uh, I kick off. I want to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are gathered, uh, especially here where uh, you know, we recognize our first generation uh, indigenous uh, uh, nation and indigenous people uh, because they have essentially accepted us to call Australia home from our motherland uh, coming from Kerala, India. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. On that note again, I wanna, uh, can I say uh, congratulations to uh, your team at DDU uh, Kaushal Kendra at QSAT uh, for curating uh, uh, this international series so well and the breadth of coverage you've had an international profile of people uh, uh, very well uh, versed with uh, various segments of business innovation entrepreneurship leadership that you've been able to cover and curate so uh, great to be part uh, an honor to be part of that uh, uh, series now uh, coming into the uh, the 12th edition of the series uh, so definitely um, privileged uh, uh, to be part of that. Can I also acknowledge uh, uh, the role of Kerala? Uh, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, that's obviously my motherland as well. I, I do come from Kerala. I uh, grew up uh, in Calicut uh, before going to Delhi uh, and rest of India before I moved to US and Australia about 21 years back, but still, uh, you know, very close to Kerala. And as uh, uh, Dr. Zekaria mentioned last weekend we um, organized a, a global uh, Onam Agosham uh, uh, globally uh, and we kind of created a global world record uh, of running a 25 hours uh, Onam event. So very passionate about doing great things for Kerala and as a global Malayali myself. Uh, and that obviously uh, is one of the things uh, I want to share that I'll be available to, uh, you know, uh, as an outreach uh, partner. Uh, you know, for any Malayalis and uh, and also Kerala uh, uh, aspirant uh, uh, entrepreneurs. I must also acknowledge uh, Kerala Startup Mission um, and the role they play. I've had amazing experience working with them and I see they are one of, not only recognized as one of the leading incubator uh, innovation ecosystem um, in, uh, in India, but also, you know, the leadership, the thought leadership and the breadth of coverage they do. And we uh, at NQ globally, we work closely with them. In fact, we have done quite a few market access program and global launch as well of startups from Kerala onto Australia. Even uh, last month, we had launched a, a couple of startups uh, in uh, healthcare tech and clean tech into Australia as well. So definitely wanted to acknowledge and uh, uh, recognize uh, uh, the role of Kerala Startup Mission and the Techno Park, uh, uh, you know, uh, team as well there. Um, amazing talent and technology, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, potential uh, to leverage for our global requirements. Can I also acknowledge um, the fact that, uh, you know, I, I, though I also, uh, you know, part of another leading group in uh, Kerala. I'm part of the TKM uh, family uh, and the TKM College of uh, Group as well, you know, myself uh, uh, from Kollam and uh, Trivandrum Belt. Uh, but I have a lot of respect for QSAT. Uh, and uh, I was there about two and a half years back uh, 
uh, you know, uh, part of a women-led entrepreneurship program to spark off, uh, you know, uh, some uh, amazing um, uh, insights, but also to spark off some uh, range of initiatives as well. So definitely um, that's something which I have a lot of uh, fond memories of. And on that note, a call out, even obviously I might reiterate this along the lines, but definitely a shout out and a call out for all of you to leverage and please use this word uh, because I'll be using this quite often and please get it in, in your DNA, leverage your network, build your network and leverage what you can from the To please do uh, reach out to Goldie and team and uh, the ANQ uh, team as well. So just on that note, um, I'll uh, get into my presentation. Uh, uh, the way I've structured this presentation uh, is uh, just considering, um, you know, where you guys are uh, as a student or, you know, uh, year two, year three or masters or uh, an aspirant uh, startup founder. I've structured this conversation uh, around obviously giving you a bit of a, uh, a background and overview of InQ. And, and while I do that, I also touch on uh, elements of scaling up and that's our focus for InQ. And even we have evolved as well. And that's something which I wanna share our story as well. And then towards the end, uh, considering a core part of scaling up uh, uh, and which I, you will hear me repeat again and again, uh, three consideration uh, considerations, uh, one being your customer validation your market validation and your investor validation. So these are key things that I kind of uh, quite often repeat, but I mean it, uh, and these are very much important when you really construct your uh, thoughts uh, in terms of your readiness uh, to scale. Uh, so that's something which I'm gonna reflect on. And then I'll also focus on the whole scale up mindset and then hone in on the investor mindset as well, because it's important to understand, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure you guys have heard about all the unicorns, all the investment race that happens. Uh, in fact, India is one of the leading uh, uh, companies who's already got about 20 plus unicorns in the last nine months or so. So what is the investment investor mindset and how do you work along with the investor mindset as well? So uh, cognizant of the time, uh, I think uh, I'll uh, run for about uh, 30, 40 minutes uh, as interactive I can. Uh, probably towards the end, uh, you know, I'm happy to take some Q&A as well. Uh, but more so, uh, please do see this uh, not as a lecture. This is kind of a conversation. But more, I want to share some insights on the opportunity as well uh, for you guys to leverage, especially from an Australia-India perspective, because we are coming together very closely as strategic partners. Um, so just a bit of an overview uh, of InQ. Obviously, we are headquartered at uh, uh, the Sydney Startup Hub uh, uh, here in Sydney, but we've got offices uh, uh, in India, that's Cochin and Bangalore, and with an office uh, in Mumbai coming up, uh, which was obviously delayed because of COVID. Uh, and we've got uh, offices in Dubai, as well as in Singapore as well. We launched ourselves, uh, uh, you know, essentially late 2017, uh, uh, but uh, we've been running this uh, Australia Innovation Bridge Program for quite some time, since 2018. And we are kind of, if you uh, look at it and the way we call ourselves, we are an open innovation uh, ecosystem enabler, as in we work with any incubator accelerators, whether it is gov backed like KSEM or, uh, you know, university or uh, educational institutions backed uh, incubator accelerator or a fund backed um, incubator accelerator as well. And we also work alongside with various entrepreneurship development cells as well across various uh, educational institutions as well. But we position ourselves as a scale-up partner where uh, whilst we did have our incubator accelerator program, but we focus on helping, uh, you know, these uh, cohort of companies or startups who are associated with these incubator accelerators or funds on how we can help them scale and scale early. So that's where uh, we, uh, you know, specialize. And of course, our current focus is to drive Australia-India market pro uh, access program bilaterally, both ways from Australia to India, because India is a huge market uh, and a partnering market, but also similarly uh, from India to Australia as a scale of market as well. And we also create pathway programs with educational institutions as well, uh, especially uh, the way 
uh, the technology and skill requirements are shaping up as well. Um, just again, uh, uh, if you want to think about uh, where in Q fits in, uh, you got to see us as a scale-up partner uh, of choice for global innovation hubs, educational institutions, startup ecosystems uh, to really look at uh, when they want to have global market access or launches in global markets. We, we want uh, to see uh, us uh, being seen as a trusted uh, scale-up advisor and partner. And where you see uh, where there are incubator accelerators who give ideas legs uh, you know, uh, to really create traction, we uh, want to see ourselves giving the wings to, to these startups to launch into global markets. As an ecosystem, an open innovation ecosystem, we've obviously got our global leadership team, um, amazing uh, set of global ambassadors and advisors, uh, but we've got obviously our cohort of uh, sector-based uh, startups. We've got our global mentors, advisors, as indicated. We've got our connects with global uh, I mean, various uh, governments and academia as well across in various uh, geographies we are involved and we have a strong connect with inter enterprise and corporates. And again, uh, we also work with various global investors, investment race platforms, angel uh, networks and funds and VCs as well. And we then curate with all this network and this whole ecosystem that we have access to, we curate uh, the right fit for purpose. Uh, you know, uh, support uh, uh, for companies to scale. So we find out who are the best advisors, who are the best ecosystem partners, who are the best kind of investors at the stage a company is, or who are the corporate partners who can give the revenue traction, or who are the gov partners to leverage some grants or funds. All these things we kind of curate and, and, and curate a tailored process for that. Some of our business teams, obviously, as I said, uh, we've got incubator, accelerator, co-working spaces. So there's one in coaching and in uh, in Sydney as well. But we do uh, global launch pad and training programs as well, especially in certain emerging tech. So we would love to collaborate and see where there are synergies. But we also run uh, uh, global conferences uh, and uh, run center of excellence. And definitely AI, ML, blockchain, cybersecurity, AR, VR are sectors that we are focused on. We've got a broad, uh, uh, you know, a, a sector tech agnostic uh, uh, perspective to how we work with companies and startups, but there is definitely uh, a certain key sectors that we focused, especially these sectors are key fo focus sectors between Australia and India, where we see we can create the maximum impact. So definitely, uh, if you are thinking or aligned to any of these sectors, we would love to talk to you and see how we can help you scale. And of course, uh, the technology drivers, as I indicated, these are some of, but they're not restrictive. So they're just more uh, a guideline and indicative of what way we focus on. One of the core focus, and this is something I've learned from my own experience and my own passion. Uh, and, and I've seen more and more, uh, at least in the last three to five years, uh, where uh, a startup, obviously the definition of a startup, uh, the, the purpose is that you're addressing a problem statement or an opportunity, uh, the market opportunity. But what I would also like to add on from my perspective, a startup has to be for a purpose and that purpose. So there's an objective there addressing a problem statement and a market opportunity. Yes, agreed. That has to be there, you know, bottom line, but definitely it has to be. But our expectation is that we work with companies on a preferential basis on companies who have a social purpose as well. The reason I'd say it's not only not for me, but I have seen more and more, especially companies looking to scale. If you are also addressing a social and community problem, or if you are creating a social and community impact, it is very well received in a global market, not only by you know, the market as such, but also investors or even the customers as well. So definitely when you think about a startup idea, and I'm I mean, I have done this exercise with many startups, just having a conversation, every startup, while they're addressing a problem statement and, uh, you know, a market opportunity, especially looking at globally, they could be also touching on some of the sustainable development goals. So I'm really passionate that startups think, even from the beginning, when you're curating your idea and you're uh, getting your co-founders organized, that there is a startup for purpose element. There is an alignment to some sustainable go development goals. And we favorably consider these uh, uh, startups and if they are aligned to some of these 17 uh, UNSDG goals. So please start thinking about these right from the beginning itself or wherever you are. Let's try and align to some of these one or two or whatever number of uh, UNSDG goals.
that's our presence. Some of the programs we do, uh, you know, some of our cohort uh, that we have globally supported, some of the events that happens uh, at uh, in Q uh, as well. So please do leverage that. Uh, our global co uh, collaboration across some of the regions. Our team here, uh, I think uh, Dilip and the team are on board today and our global uh, advisory uh, and mentorship uh, team um, and some of our global partners, educational partners. I'm just flicking through uh, so that you know that we've got a uh, uh, closer uh, uh, you know, overview of what uh, we do. Uh, as I said, we are partnered with a lot of educational institutions. Uh, we are partnered, obviously, official scale-up partner for Australia with K uh, Kela Startup Mission. We partner with 100 uh, open startups, uh, Niti Aayog, Atal Innovation Mission, T-Hub, uh, and uh, quite a few other groups as well. So definitely would love to uh, create and curate pathways for QSAT uh, students and entrepreneurs um, as well for uh, scaling up and wherever we can provide support from our, our ecosystem as well. So on that note, let me come uh, to our core uh, topic of today's session. Now, um, for me, um, when do you uh, think about scaling up? A lot of people think about uh, scaling up very late into the game. From my perspective, or at least my view, a startup has got in its inherent fabric of its purpose and its structure, and in, even its in definition, that it has to be scalable. Because if it is a startup like a corner shop, I've got a corner grocery shop or a uh, you know, in Kerala, we have all this margin-free supermarket or a, 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 a small restaurant or something. That's not a startup. Obviously, you have to have a problem statement, market opportunity, a innovative uh, differentiation and some USP. Uh, uh, otherwise, I mean, you are just like a small business or a, you know, a, a one-off uh, business. Some of those uh, 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 businesses start up as like, uh, you know, start like a small business, but they build franchises or networks and then they grow and they become uh, more scalable. But from me, my perspective, any startup which is underpinned by certain problem uh, statement and addressing a market opportunity and defined by some technological or innovation, whether it is um, the service or the product being lend, uh, you know, delivered, and it has got a USP, uh, a unique selling point, then it is inherent in its fabric that it has to be scalable. Why? Because a startup is has to be investable. And for an, a startup to be investable, and for an investor, and I'm talking about beyond the three Fs, the family, friends, and the fools, uh, where for an external investor, whether it's an angel or someone to come on board to invest in a startup, they need to feel that this startup is scalable. So from my perspective, every startup by its inherent, inherent DNA, startup DNA has to be scalable. It has to be scale, scale up ready. But what is the challenge or uh, the opportunity in this case, but also uh, where the variation happens is when is a startup ready to scale? And that is a decision. Obviously some of the startups make pretty early and some of them come through uh, uh, organic growth and they have certain key milestones before they think about scaling up. And it could be based on whether uh, the team resources, funding, or even the market opportunity as well. They, they may make, make decisions. But what I wanted to leave uh, a, a key message, a takeaway for you all is that when you have a startup, once you have an MVP and you've got some early revenues, which has obviously helped you validate your product or service, uh, that you've got some customer validation done, you've got some market validation done, and when you've got some investor validation, I'm not saying that you've got you've raised your um, you know, uh, heavy seed rounds or series A, no, even before that, once you've got some paying customers, someone else believes that they can buy your product or service uh, by paying uh, you know, uh, you know, some kind of funds to buy your service or seek your service, then that's there is the customer validation. Market validation obviously is critical. Obviously, you don't want to be investing into a startup which has got a diminishing market or the market size, you know, diminishes. You don't want, want to invest now, uh, you know, in too many brick and mortar or, uh, uh, or businesses, uh, you know, which are using age-old technology or age-old uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, platforms which are uh, essentially uh, obsolete now. So any market which has got, uh, 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 you know, a diminishing kind of a market size, uh, you know, people would want to stay away from it. So definitely you got to be in addressing a market segment which is growing. So not only the total addressable market, but also your target segment uh, that you are looking at to address as well. So specific, uh, you know, addressable market that you have. Then we've got the global uh, the investor validation as well. So as a startup, you want to think uh, that you are able to uh, look at uh, getting some investors. So this is again, just as I said, there is a paying customer. There needs to be some investor who believes in your USP, your scalability, that you are going to give return investments. So obviously, there are different kinds of investors. We'll touch on that as well. But what I want to really emphasize is that it has to have some kind of investor who's external to the co-founders or the three Fs that who believes um, in your proposition, your startup proposition, uh, before we can say your scale up ready. So for me, again, when you look at just assessing yourself, and this is something I would recommend every startup or aspirant uh, startup founders as they go into this journey, startup journey, they evaluate themselves very regularly. I would say every three to six months, um, you know, as part of your team uh, assessment, to really understand whether you've got some good customer validation, good, you know, some early revenue traction, you've got some good market validation, whether in your, uh, you know, your own country or your nearby regions or global regions where there could be a better traction. And I'll give some very good examples as well. And then you want to also evaluate whether you've got onboarded some investor interest uh, uh, and, uh, you know, that you've got some uh, external investors on board as well. Once you do that, obviously that's when we come into play where we can help you handhold you to really help you do that as, uh, you know, uh, that uh, evaluation or that validation as well, whether you're scale up ready. But at least at your end as well, these are key things that help you gauge whether you're scale up ready, that you've got some customer validation, you've got paying customer validation, not just a pilot, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, trial uh, customers. No, that's obviously uh, uh, expected that you. Or breadth of research any startup has done in terms of validating the entire market, but also the market they're going to hone in on or they, they're going to really specifically delve into and address and the size and that it is sustainable and uh, growing. And also the product or the proposition that the startup has got to offer is got the sustainable competitive advantage. Uh, whereas where uh, they're also as part of the market validation, they really identify and understand in the competitive landscape where they are positioned and how they are able to differentiate and build that sustainable competitive advantage as well. Uh, and of course, as I said, uh, the investor validation, we don't look at, and this is again, when I talk about investor mindset, we don't want to be the first investor, period. I mean, obviously there has to be some first investor and we, we will work through, I mean, whether it's an angel or any other, and ties uh, a, a great a group to work with as well, but there are angel networks as well who are actively involved. Um, but when you're looking at scaling up, uh, you know, the investors want to uh, know that you've got uh, some kind of uh, investor validation done as well. So based on these validation, then we come into play, or organizations like us, the ecosystem partners come into play and see how we can help you scale. And when, you, when we do the scale up uh, validation, we look at a market. So what we would do is for Australia, for, for example, we would uh, you know, do some early customer validation, whether we will be able to get some uh, you know, paying customers uh, you know, uh, or some early advisors who can vouch for uh, getting some uh, paying customers. Uh, and then market validation, we would do our research along with you guys to see that this, uh, this uh, product is not just meant for India, but is scalable for Australia as well. For example, we just launched a company called DoFD. Uh, uh, which stands for Doctors for Everybody, which is uh, out of Calicut uh, and Cochin, I believe. 
uh, we just launched them. And the, the, the initial, I mean, they've got good customer validation, they've got investor validation and good mar market traction and they're doing good with their revenue source and they're a great team as well. A bunch of uh, doctors and uh, technologists together who shaped that uh, startup. But when we looked at it first, when we validated, obviously they've got their validation that they're scale up ready. They ticked all the boxes. But when we looked at uh, Australia, we said, well, this is a crowded market. Remote healthcare services is a crowded market. What is the value proposition? What is the USP? Will that be sustainable? So we obviously got some of our advisors involved to do the customer and market validation. We were able to identify a niche segment where DOE4D could really help uh, a country like Australia, where we've got a, a huge expat population. I'm not just talking about Indian expat, but global, uh, you know, migrant expat population, uh, where they would really resonate with uh, a remote healthcare, a personalized uh, 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 a doctor for the family, or even, um, you know, providing a medical second opinion, all these services, which these guys were offering. And we saw that as a good uh, segment and a growing segment to really target and really push into. And we saw that if we are able to get them validated in a market like Australia and launch them into Australia and then take them to Middle East, we know that there is a lot more Malayali or a lot more Indian expats in Middle East than in Australia. But once we are able to launch them, validate them here, and then if you take an, uh, an Indian product, uh, uh, you know, compared to taking an Indian product a solution to Middle East directly versus uh, Indian product, which has uh, got all Australian validation and adoption and branding and, you know, uh, you know uh, the whole profile. And if we launch an Australian product or service into Middle East, it'll be perceived very well. And it'll be seen as a high growth venture for investors to come on board as well. So we took that journey and we, we're hand holding them through the whole journey and we've launched them now into Australia and we are working through creating traction in terms of, you know, onboarding more customers, launching them through some of the global events and pl platform, uh, but also helping them investment, raise investment through our investment raise platforms as well. So that's a bit of an example of how we would work through once there's a validation done and then we, uh, you know, uh, onboard them and launch them. And obviously, this is where, uh, you know, as I said, uh, target mar market launch. And this is where, again, I want to highlight, we will work uh, uh, on the best fit uh, and best approach. So there was another med tech company uh, which were into uh, portable uh, uh, tracking devices for, uh, you know, uh, your uh, cardiovascular system, uh, not for acute patients, but more for uh, as a preemptive and preventative uh, early stage uh, uh, cardio patients. Uh, we liked what was uh, being offered there again, out of Kela ecosystem, uh, I think out of uh, the Kundara, uh, the Kollam uh, Techno Park or something. But we really saw that they not only had a great product, which, uh, you know, um, had uh, potential traction for uh, Australia, but they also had a great uh, capability for design iterations and also as a med tech uh, partner for some of the Australian startups or Australian companies as well. So we launched them and we pursued a multiple uh, pronged approach uh, to really help them, not only to help scale their product and uh, immerse into Australia, get Australian uh, TGA certification, all those things, uh, but also uh, we are working with them uh, to raise investment in India, but also Australia, and also essentially make them as a medtech enabler a uh, partner for a lot of medtech startups from Australia or even uh, some of the medtech companies uh, from Australia. So they become uh, an India design, uh, you know, dev partner, a technology partner, uh, but also they are able to help, uh, you know, help the manufacturer and things as well. So kind of it's a uh, fit for purpose. It's not a one size fits all. various startups uh, ecosystems and definitely Kela Startup Mission, uh, T-Hub in uh, Telangana and uh, in um, uh, Bangalore with K-Tech we are working through is to build some soft landing programs uh, and ecosystem partner led programs. What it means is that we will uh, help, especially once we've done the scale up validation before they get launched into this market, uh, we will help them uh, do a soft landing program 
which means that you will have about a month to three months of program where they'll be able to virtually connect with various mentors, advisors, and industry partners and ecosystem partners working alongside uh, uh, sector specific as well as, uh, you know, technology specific. Uh, they will be able to work with them and essentially handhold them for them to be scale up ready or launch ready. So that's another thing that uh, we'll be happy to facilitate. And that's what we do as part of our market launch program. Now, the next part of the session, I'm going to delve into the whole investor readiness mindset because this is a, a key part of scaling up. Uh, I've touched on the customer validation, market validation, and what approach we take. But the investor, uh, you know, capital raising and investor mindset uh, uh, is core part of market scaling and scale-up mindset. So some of the uh, uh, intel I want to share and I want to recognize uh, my uh, one of the partner organization, investor raise, uh, investment cap raise platform called Wholesale Investors and CRISP that I'm actively involved in. Some of the startups we have launched from Australia into India, sorry, all, India to Australia are all on this platform as we help them raise uh, investment as part of the scale-up uh, uh, program. Uh, some of the trending sectors that we are saying, seeing in the scale-up uh, space is healthcare, tech, biotech, life sciences, um, you know, deep tech and broader uh, uh, SaaS-based technology, AI-based technology, renewable tech and clean tech, agri, agri-tech is huge. Financial services, obviously, been there for a long time, but we are seeing, um, uh, you know, fintech, uh, reg tech, uh, you know, uh, and the compliance and regulatory compliance space that we are seeing a lot more of traction uh, than robotics and blockchain as well. In terms of our uh, database that we are seeing um, a, a lot more traction. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, this edu tech has become a crowded space. I know by Jews and others are all active in India. Uh, but that's also another space where we've seen a lot of uh, impact in India. But unlike other markets, we haven't seen that because we probably were already digital and disrupted. Uh, so there's not been a huge growth, unlike in India, where uh, COVID had created a lot of uh, uh, disruptions. But yeah, obviously, I uh, also want to touch on uh, the, the first typical first investment, and that scale of investment as well. We see even when you're launching uh, anywhere between uh, 50 to uh, 250K is what we look at uh, when you do a scale up uh, 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 investment, uh, which is uh, 50K is about 25 lakhs uh, Indian rupees. Uh, so anywhere from 25 lakhs to one crore uh, is what we look at uh, scale up investment. That's what we raise in uh, various tranches or through our, our uh, investment uh, platforms. Uh, but then of course there are follow up, uh, follow on rounds, whether uh, Series A or Series A beyond uh, into Series B and into pre ipo as well that we work through. Um, now what I wanted to again touch on, um, um, you know, um, is matching the investors and this is again there is no art uh, and there is no science here uh, it's just uh, it, it has to be connect and sometimes it connects the first time or it's a relationship that you need to nurture with um, investors as well so obviously this is where we come into play but also i would strongly encourage that every startup need to have even early stage they need to be thinking that they need to be investor ready for being scale up ready. And they need to have an IM pitch deck. And I'll be happy to share, uh, I'm sure you've already got access to these resources, but I'll be happy to share a standard IM deck, an investment memorandum uh, or investment rates pitch deck, um, which has got certain key elements that you need to have uh, to really have a conversation and position yourself well uh, when you're having those conversations with investors or scale up partners or, you know, just with the ecosystem partners as well. So a lot of uh, this again is through experience and, you know, iterations, you all, it's a, it's a journey. It's not a one-off thing. I'm done. I'm going to do this pitch and I'll get the money now. I mean, of course, once you are at a later stage, when you have proven yourself and you've got some good runs on the board with investors and scaling up, then it's easier because you can talk to your existing investors for follow on investors. But the early stage investment and scale up investment, it, there is obviously an inflection point uh, as part of your scale up uh, or startups uh, growth uh, journey where you need to be really trading uh, you know, very actively to see 
how you are positioning yourself, your proposition for that market that I'm looking to scale or the investor that I'm targeting to come on board. So you need to really evolve with your pitch deck and really, uh, you know, polish it good enough so that it looks a very impactful, succinct pitch uh, and that even the investment ask uh, gives enough uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, traction for the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the next phase that you're looking with this um, investment to grow or scale, but also the utilization of the funds need to be appropriate as well. So we've seen a lot of startups, you know, uh, you know, say pluck some number in the air. I need $1 million uh, uh, because I've got this kind of market size. We don't, we don't take that series at all. We really delve into uh, figuring out how that can be dissected, where this 1 million isn't really worthwhile. So, Essentially, you need to really structure your IM deck as well. Then the other point I want to talk is every investor may not be the right person for right investor for, uh, you know, uh, uh, any startup. It has to be very much, it has to be aligned, especially when you are in the uh, early stage or scale up stage, you need to look at strategic investors. An investor uh, who not only puts the money, but they bring their network, they bring their uh, strategic network. I mean, someone like uh, uh, SR and RNG, he brings that kind of passion, the network, uh, along with whatever the investment that uh, comes along uh, being part of Thai. So Thai is a great network uh, where they bring the power of network and what I call a strategic investment. So there is a need to match the right investor to the, the startup at the right stage. And we, again, as ecosystem partners, we facilitate that as well. And also we want to uh, see uh, that what the investor wants to see, you're able to really offer because otherwise there could be a disconnect or you have to work and nurture on that whole investor relationship journey because initially, obviously the reality of, the reality of your what you're offering may not be what the investor is looking to see. Uh, I mean, I've seen startups uh, throw in... Uh, Without any justification, I've got an AI-backed or blockchain-enabled solution. Okay, so what? I know those are technology, but what is the real impact in terms of market uh, scaling, uh, growth, um, return on investment, and impact to the uh, you know the whole uh, uh, market that it's going to provide? That's what we will be looking for in terms of not that AI blockchain is going to make us. Uh, um, look good? Uh, no. Ultimately, the bottom line is the ROI, the market uh, potential, uh, the great team that you have, and also, uh, you know, how scalable it is and sustainable it is. So definitely uh, earlier you can align uh, what the investor is looking for versus what uh, you have to offer will be ideal. Uh, so again, the investor psychological process as well, I want to touch on. Um, you know, um, again, this is also, you got to play into the investor mindset as well here. Obviously, uh, you know, when they are putting their money, their time, their reputation as well, and looking at the opportunity, they also got an opportunity co cost as well, because uh, they might be uh, rather, you know, focusing on another opportunity rather than uh, focusing on you as a startup or your startup founder. So definitely uh, there is a, a need for you to address all those elements that makes them really ready for that scale up investment or that backing that you need from that investor. They're not just putting their money time and, and, and their reputation on the line, but they're justified that working with you guys is going to give them that kind of traction or growth uh, where they can be part of that growth as well. Uh, and which is uh, sets them uh, better off than focusing on other opportunity as well. Uh, so, as I touched on, um, um, uh, that investors, typically any investor doesn't want to be the first and also they ha have the fear of missing out as well. So, they don't want to be missing out. So, especially uh, some of the investors uh, we bring on board, especially in the scale-up readiness space or pre-CDC space, which is where we typically operate, uh, they definitely like to uh, see that they are not the only one uh, putting the money because they want to obviously make sure that, uh, that psychologically um, they have de-risked themselves, that they are the, not the only people 
you know, getting into this uh, 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 solution, but also uh, they, at the same point, they want to make sure that they don't miss out. So more and more you're seeing startup, uh, sorry, investors that they help validate with co-investors or other investors to make sure that, especially at a later stage of uh, uh, a company like a pre-series A, before you raise a series A investment or before you scale up, where we know that those key milestones, when you hit, you're going to have a growth. So a lot of uh, startups, uh, investors come at that stage that they want to make sure that they don't miss out on that growth, where it's going to deliver three or four X uh, kind of growth and a better uh, ROI and access to a high growth uh, uh, venture investment. So definitely you need to play into that as well, that they need to feel that they're not uh, the only the first guys to validate, but also they need to have a, a fear of missing out as well. So they don't want to be missing out as well. And as I said, uh, there is a bit of a bandwagon effect. Uh, if there are uh, co-investors, they want to be part of it, you know, uh, and even, even if it's uh, in smaller tranches, they love to, uh, especially in the scale up phase, that there are uh, co-investors and we again help uh, giving some of these investors a nudge as well. And as I touched on the fear of uh, missing out uh, uh, factor as well. So again, um, you know, what uh, I've also seen and I kind of uh, have thrown uh, uh, startups uh, and founders, uh, you know, um, off uh, uh, because as for startup founders, their product solution is the best thing in the world. For them, it's the best innovative thing uh, in the world. It's like their baby as well. So they're too close to it. Uh, and when we, as investors ask some tough questions, uh, they feel offended and I've seen that. And so my recommendation to especially scale up founders is that don't be offended because this is part of the journey. You are in a startup journey. You need to be ready for those tough questions. We might be asking you, how are you gonna look at your exit? What are the strategies you are having to justify your growth? How can I get 5, 10x growth? I mean, as an investor, because they are putting their money and, uh, you know, what are their savings or whatever it is, uh, you know, for a reason. Of course, some of them want impact and, you know, social growth and stuff and all. But as an investor, bottom line, they're looking at uh, scale up uh, growth. They're looking at um, probably a, a short term uplift, whether it is valuation or even return. But some of them definitely want to know that I can exit at some point. You know, some people may do a complete exit or some people may uh, want to do a partial exit. But these are things as a startup, you need to be ready, uh, uh, you know, to be prepared upfront. And this is all required as part of your scale up process as well. So please be prepared. Don't be offended, uh, you know, uh, when you are asked these uh, hard questions because you're bound to. And one of the things me and my colleague uh, Steve at uh, uh, Wholesale Investors, uh, we say that they every startup needs to think uh, from an investor's perspective that they don't deserve to be investable or they, they don't deserve to be invested into. They need to really work towards getting uh, themselves to be invested into. So they need to prove to the investors that we are more than worthy for you to put your confidence, trust, and money into our uh, solution. So they need to work towards and acquire that investment um, trust uh, and that confidence as well. So, of course, if you are in a later stage of the company, yes, you've already proven your track record. You've got some uh, uh, Sequoia and other VC firms already backing you. Then, you know, you already have justified. And then it's a... Uh, investors and VC firms who are fighting to uh, be part of, uh, you know, uh, your uh, investment raise story. But early stage and scale up stage, you need to be ready uh, that you are uh, dealing with some tough questions and also you're able to uh, really impart uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, confidence in the investment as well. I'm just uh, uh, conscious of time. Uh, some of the uh, 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 common mistakes that we uh, investors, uh, sorry, startup founders do part of uh, investment raise and scale up investment is they're overconfident. They think they have got the best solution. Start with that there is someone else in the world that has got some similar solution like you. Then now you justify working towards what is your USP and how are you going to build 
your SCA, which is a sustainable competitive advantage, considering someone's out there who's got some similar solution. Of course, you know, the patents, IP, and all those come into play, but you need to make sure that you're not overconfident giving that I've got the best solution in the world because I don't believe in that. There is every solution, there's something parallel, but you obviously create traction in the market, either with your solution, your user experience, the best fit for the market and the traction that you're able to create. So you need to make sure that you're not overconfident, unwilling to invest in the whole process. So investment race is not like I have a conversation, I put the money next week. It can happen, but most of the cases, and in fact, I've seen some of these founders saying that my uh, uh, round is closing two weeks time, and uh, you need to, uh, are you ready to invest? That's not the way to offer. You give them enough time to digest and work through and build that relationship and on that whole process. Just not be re reliant on one investor. Please be working, I would say, three to five investors in parallel at various stages. And you nurture that relationship as well and build that confidence. You'll be amazed. Some of the investors who you would have had a conversation three, five years back, they become your Series B investors and at a much a larger ticket size than uh, your uh, early stage investors. And uh, yeah, obviously, please don't give any time pressure to the investors, especially in the scale up spaces as well. Uh, some of the things that uh, when we look at uh, scale up investment, uh, we obviously look at the sector you are and the market that is growth uh, happening, founders, board and management. We look for diversity. When I say it's gender, it's uh, expertise, uh, experience, background, all those things, you know, we just don't want to have uh, start up, uh, and again, I don't believe, I don't really don't believe uh, that a startup with a single founder has got the tenacity, the propensity, uh, and the sustainability factor. I would always encourage startups and startup founders to look for co-founders. You don't need to dilute huge amount of uh, equity, but having a co-founder is always, uh, you know, great. And as a scale up, uh, uh, you know, uh, validation, we look for startups having multiple co-founders, especially with, uh, you know, you know uh, scale up uh, investments and stuff, uh, you know, and validation with universities, government grants, all these are help, they help us validate your scalability and your investment readiness, your corporate brands that you're involved with, current shareholders, what your cap table looks like, and any of the uh, growth uh, numbers that you can show as well, all are relevant uh, in this space. I think I'll uh, pause at that uh, point, um, but I'll just flick through a few things that um, obviously we've got an Australia India Innovation Bridge program, which uh, helps uh, startups uh, scale uh, early and we help do the validation as long as uh, as i said those three validation customer market and investor validation you've done we'll be happy to look at and uh, you know gauge with you there's a lot of tech uh, and industry 4.0 related uh, opportunities uh, for companies in uh, india and kerala uh, to support the australian ecosystem in play and we at the australian india business council we're working at, uh, actively with startup india invest india as well to really facilitate that path and our target is we want to launch every um, if not every year, but every six months as well, if possible, um, you know, five to six startups uh, or, or scale them into Australian market as well. Um, we know about the uh, Indian uh, uh, unicorn, but I believe, um, you know, if we look at uh, launching into global markets, you create a lot more impact and scalability and you can create that traction pretty uh, quickly. Uh, Australian ecosystem, obviously not... Uh, that big like India, but it's about uh, sixth, uh, uh, you know, fifth or sixth uh, startup friendly nation. And we've got very uh, good support as well uh, to grow and with the government as well. A lot of funding, a lot of grants. So definitely I would strongly encourage. We've got some success stories uh, 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 from Australia. I wouldn't want to touch too much, but yeah, great growth stories, a great ecosystem that we have um, um, in uh, Australia. Thai is also active here. So definitely. Uh, would we'll be happy uh, to connect and support through our ecosystem and some good success stories uh, and some of the uh, startups who have uh, done really well and unicorns here. Uh, obviously, there's a growth opportunity in the digital space. So all the AI data, 
and machine learning, blockchain, cyber security, all is a huge opportunity to service Australian market. Uh, and a lot of companies have done really well. Some of the sectors I would strongly recommend you look at financial services, uh, uh, the resources, uh, as in uh, resources, uh, mining and those sectors, uh, anything around that, agriculture and food tech, uh, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing industry 4.0, big data, um, IoT enabled manufacturing, health med tech is a huge sector, infrastructure, infra tech and prop tech is also another huge sector for scaling up. Uh, consumer and retail, obviously, in Australia is not a huge market, but a great validated market before you scale into uh, Europe or uh, into US and education, edutech as well being uh, the markets. So I'll end on that note, uh, thanking you. Um, and again, it's a it's a journey that you need to be prepared for. Uh, and, the, and one of the things I want to leave you with is I would encourage, and again, um, there are hits and misses here, is that you use LinkedIn. I'm sure you guys are already on LinkedIn, but leverage LinkedIn. Be persistent. Uh, you know, definitely reach out to me. But again, you can you have to appreciate people are busy. But do reach out and target who are your people as part of your scaling up or your startup journey that you want to be associated. So leverage uh, LinkedIn. Again, you heard me say, and leverage the ecosystem partners like NQ or Kela Startup Mission and other IDECs or global uh, you know platforms you have to really uh, leverage and how you can uh, 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 you know, gain from it, but also grow from that. And the other thing I wanna offer uh, is through uh, Dr. Zakaria and uh, Dr. Anjani, we will um, enable access through our NQ uh, Academy we have for entrepreneurship, where we've got some amazing content around investment days, scale up readiness, uh, which you as part of the community, you can leverage and uh, even have access to some of our global mentors as well. And we'll be happy to work with uh, uh, Dr. Zakaria, uh, Dr. Ranjani and team uh, uh, with guidance from uh, SR and I, sir, as well uh, to really uh, shape some targeted cohorts as well uh, to support uh, the startups coming up out of your educational institutions. And please do leverage our INQ ecosystem in Cochin as well. So I'll uh, uh, leave on that again, reinforcing leverage, the power of network, out, outreach into ecosystem and those three things, customer validation, market validation, and investor validation that you need to take and be ready for uh, uh, a journey rather than, um, you know, just looking at uh, the next step. Thank you. And uh, I'll uh, uh, invite uh, Dr. Anjani and uh, Dr. Zakaria to, um, you know, uh, wrap it up. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'm, I'm open for some questions as well. Uh, thank you very much, sir. It was a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, really uh, energetic and uh, very, very enthusiastic presentation, I should say. A lot of input for our students. We were talking about the most uh, important things as far as an entrepreneur is uh, required in terms of the uh, connectivity, uh, in terms of uh, taking the leverage of opportunities. Uh, one thing that I noticed, the most important which I noticed, uh, especially most of them are management students and teachers. We always talk about uh, competency management, competency. The most important thing which I noticed the usage that, that you made the, using the term sustainable competency, right? Competitive advantage. So competitive advantage must be sustainable. That is something very, very important. I think all management students should keep it in mind. You may be unique today, but what about tomorrow? You have to continue or with your uh, talents and potentials and you have to innovate consistently your services and offers. Then only you can be continuously successful. That is what is, I think, uh, Mr. Fun means sustainable competitive advantage. So that is something which uh, you should notice. So now it is a time for uh, to, to your question and answer. I think uh, Dr. Anjani will uh, take the questions and uh, will uh, put to Dr. Fun. Okay. Is there any Thank questions you, in the chat box? The students, you can put in chat box also, or you can yes, directly yes. ask. Yes. So hello, hello, participants sir. can uh, unmute and uh, speak, ask the questions directly, or you can post your uh, questions in the chat box also. In the chat box, there are a couple of questions. Uh, yes, uh, Shajin, sir, would like to ask something? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. So, uh, sir, it was really an awesome session, first of all. 
was it was a new area actually this is the first time actually we are getting a new area about the investors and how the investments need to be uh, found so my question is actually how long really a startup uh, should work in their local environment um, to be ready for a scale up and i i think i tried to cover that uh, uh, obviously the, the part of the whole startup journey uh, typically some of them use some figures i mean if you've got with that revenue it has to be in a grow i mean again market validation as i said it has to be a growing market uh because you don't want to be uh launching into a market where it's not growing so you definitely want to make that call uh and then of course having some early investors as well so in terms of my experience um you know typically as long as you can validate and confirm you got these three things anywhere from the second year onwards second year onwards okay. uh you know you should be seriously thinking about uh, scaling up it doesn't mean that you are ready but you are thinking about scaling up and 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 you are obviously building on those three validation as well uh, you are uh, being part of various uh, accelerator program market access program and please don't shy away um, and and as long as you're not diluting with, uh, you know yourself with every program but where there are certain programs which is adding value which is bringing your you strategic advisors strategic investors and strategic growth then you i would say take that uh, program so definitely these things will give you the right confidence and they will work with you to make sure uh, that they validate uh, that your scale up ready but typically if you have some revenue validation customer validation market growth growth validation uh, and you are like it's not mvp stage so obviously at least two years uh, with some kind of traction you are ready to prepare for scaling up um, and and that's probably my thumb rule uh, anything earlier we are still looking for validation um, you know and and also as i touched on that sustainable competitive advantage looking at a global landscape of where you are positioned with your offering against the other players i mean i typically and without being um, prejudiced here when i tell my australian startup i've got the best uh, clean tech company okay have you checked uh, singapore have you checked uh, uh, the indian ecosystem have you checked uh, the israeli ecosystem have you checked the uh, the L london and the french ecosystem forget about uh, even uh, uh, silicon valley at least have you checked do a research on companies in these segment in these uh, uh, areas and uh, try and see if you got something close and see that you've got a sustainable competitive advantage so definitely thinking uh, even and that's where part of preparation for scaling up comes into play and that happens uh, typically after you know year 2 onwards or closer to that time thank you sir thank you sir okay now the questions and the chat box uh, vishnu vivek is asking would like to know how this uh, how a small country like israel is able to produce so many startups so this is where uh, i love this because i teach uh, uh, some of the mba students here and some of the leading uh, business uh, uh, schools here um, what we curate uh, is the whole entrepreneurial mindset israel knows they are confined by uh, you know you know countries uh, may or may not be favorable to them whatever it is but they've got core talent and the only way they can uh, you know grow their economy is by having amazing innovation and 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 also global partnership if you see israel works with india you know very closely because they know that their innovation for them to make it scalable market like india provides the right kind of uh, you know uh, growth scale and if they are able to bring leverage their uh, innovation their ip um, into collaborate with india then they can obviously create a global proposition with a high market uh, you know scalability and impact so obviously it's all around the entrepreneurial mindset 
because this is about you know survival of the fittest and you know they for them to really become sustainable they have to be innovative i mean uh, there been some phenomenal innovation so that's why i always call out go check israeli ecosystem if there is something similar or better than you guys and then prove to me and come with my research that you've got something better and patented or something that you can prove and justify so yes uh, you know a market like israel they are phenomenal and i had soft to them that they've uh, got that entrepreneurial mindset and we are trying to do in fact india as well uh, it's great uh, because this innovation where earlier it was frugal innovation was uh, associated with something you know half a zard or you know uh, put together uh, which may not be sustainable now we are looking at innovation coming out of tier 2 tier 3 cities as well which is coming to the forefront and we are actively involved in really nurturing some of the innovation coming out of the regional tier 2 tier 3 cities as well uh, so we shouldn't be confined uh, we shouldn't think that we've got a confinement as long as we've got something innovative uh, scalable and we can work with and leverage our networks to really grow uh, that shouldn't be a limiting factor and yeah obviously israel has got that entrepreneurial mindset we need to be having that entrepreneurial mindset every every even an employee a government employee or a or a a corporate employee they are doing some work and as part of their work they can definitely identify a problem statement or a market opportunity and that kind of entrepreneurial mindset has to be you know whether it's entrepreneurship within the organization i'm driving innovation or within my government i'm driving innovation it's, it doesn't need to be uh, entirely novel idea it could be innovation where it's something which is adding value or uh, providing a benefit to that organization or just the team so that kind of entrepreneurial mindset really uh, plays a, a strong role i must again acknowledge uh, like atal innovation and their whole tinkering labs program which is widespread in uh, india we are trying to do something similar learning from that in australia where trying to bring that entrepreneurial mindset even year 8 year 9 student onwards uh, you know eighth uh, standard ninth student uh, student onwards you know we are trying to bring that entrepreneurial mindset as well and that helps us uh, you know uh, and 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 our economy in india as well you know you got to look at it's going to be not driven by conglomerates uh, going forward it could be an aggregated set of startup and innovative and global uh, startup they're going to drive the economy as well forward so definitely there shouldn't be any limiting factors and we have got a lot of lessons to learn from israel so again the next question is how can startups in developing countries compete in international markets what are the major obstacles i mean india has got wealth uh, of data the digital profile penetration and the sheer market size i mean when i talk to some of the australian startups just one there is a segment called mass teach segment that's a mass prestige segment so a lot of australian startups and products are aligned to that because the price point is where it is addressing that mass teach segment mass prestige segment the sheer size of that segment is 200 million you know and they go wow this is crazy i mean this is we got to be part of this so i wouldn't be limited in fact the action is going to be in india uh, you know middle east and africa for the next uh, uh, 15 20 years so and india has got such a, a growth trajectory uh, you know i wouldn't uh, feel uh, that there is any limitation of course where you feel there are limitations in terms of access to funding or access to ecosystems that's where you really and digitally now we can be connected with any ecosystem you're not limited by any physical ecosystem so please do leverage uh, where you feel that there are constraints and especially any of the tier 2 tier 3 cities they shouldn't feel that they're limited with technology penetration digital penetration uh, that's not uh, uh, you know a, a limiting factor anymore and i don't believe in uh, you know uh, developing nation or developed nation it's uh, essentially uh, you know driven by growth opportunity uh, the market opportunity and the social impact that you create in fact a uh, couple of things i strongly encourage australian uh, uh, startups uh, and also women entrepreneurs to look at india as a market because they not only create commercial growth so they not only create commercial value so roi uh, you know uh, 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 value as well they, they create growth but also they create social impact they create uh, social change 
Uh, and that's got profound impact as well. So uh, that's where I see opportunities in developing countries a lot more uh, for startups uh, to not only have commercial uh, growth, but also social impact. And then they create the ultimate kind of recipe for uh, the startups to really uh, align. And, and hence, I, as I touched on the UN SDG goals, really focus on those as well. And there is another question from Jagar. Uh, how do I determine my startup cost and other expenses in the international market? So, uh, how do I, sorry? How do I determine my startup cost and other expenses in the international market? That's yeah. I mean, uh, the thumb rule, the thumb rule would be you got to keep your cost low. And this is our expectation as an investor as well. You, you want to be bootstrapped as much. You can, but there is a stage there where you can't be bootstrapped because it's going to adversely impact your team and, you know, going to create frustration and even, you know, uh, close down the startup as well. So you got to be ready, uh, you know, uh, to run your company bootstrap. Uh, but in terms of going into different markets, you want to see, Either you've got investment raise that so that you can go into this market you're on your own or look for partners who can offset your initial capex or initial, uh, you know, uh, the, the initial uh, barrier there is uh, with the cost through some kind of collaboration. Of course, that comes in with uh, what is the effort value and, uh, you know, equity you are able to dilute. But that's a decision for each of the startups at the right time uh, that they need to, need to make a decision. So it's not about just cost, cost offset. Of course, different markets will have different um, costs to launch. But this is where you work with ecosystem partners, these market access programs, as well as partners in different markets where they don't essentially uh, create a big impact for your uh, you know, bottom line, your uh, budget and your financials, but also they don't uh, impact your uh, you know, cap table uh, dilution as well. So you work with partners. Uh, but of course, if you have raised investment, for example, Baiju's uh, or Ola, they launched in India. Uh, they didn't need an investment because they already had, uh, you know, the, the big uh, uh, VC firms already invested uh, for scaling up into this market. So that's a different game. But if you're in early stage and you don't want to be outlaying uh, funds for that, you work with partners so that who, they can help you with scale. Of course, uh, once you raise investment uh, in that market, my recommendation is that you all allocate some fund or you work with partners, but you essentially raise uh, investment in that target market because that also validates your product or proposition uh, with that investor validation in your target market. Okay, I think uh, we're running out of time. So uh, just one last question. Uh, this is from Akshay. Other than government policies, what could be the reasons for China's good performance uh, uh, you know, as well as startups go? Other than government policies to support uh, the cost system, what could be the reasons for China's uh, performance? Well, uh, I would say uh, uh, 20, 2005 to 2020, was uh, the growth phase of uh, China, not only startups, but all innovation uh, and large scale, mid size scale. So, I mean, I'll be honest, uh, where we stand in India, as I know, we've got a long way to go in terms of our manufacturing capability. That's one key. And I know, and I really respect what both uh, the Fed, the central and the state governments are doing to really enhance that capability. For example, I can vouch for one of the best med tech manufacturing facility in the world exists in uh, uh, Patnam and AMZ, AMTZ. So I'm actively working with even some of the Australian companies or even our startup cohorts in India. Like you do the design and uh, you know some early manufacturing, but the scale manufacturing, you go and do it in AMTZ because you can leverage the economies of scale. So that was a key factor where China has done really well where not only the innovation that they had homegrown, but also they had all these international players looking to leverage their manufacturing, their scale in, scaled infrastructure, uh, uh, and especially the electronics industry. I mean, a lot of people, even during pandemic, a lot of things got exposed. I mean, we had all this uh, um, 
sanitizers and stuff manufactured in india the bottles manufactured in india but the nozzle was manufactured in china and it had supply chain issues all these uh, devices they had electronics manufactured in uh, china where that again created uh, exposure and risk uh, to uh, supply chain so uh, global supply chains have been disrupted uh, and uh, you know with the new geopolitical uh, landscape in play with quad Uh, us australia uh, japan and uh, india are closely working towards you know strategic partnerships but also to really not to be uh, dictated by any single economy every country is building self reliance as well so um, and 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 i'll speak for australia as well i have not seen as much of investment into manufacturing advanced manufacturing within australia in fact covid is also exposed and i'll be honest globally covid has changed the landscape completely it has exposed the whole federalism of i mean probably i'm sounding a bit uh, a bit of a political uh, theory here but this is again impacting economy and startups to see an opportunity where covid is exposed the whole federalism states versus states is happening we saw that even in india when uh, the whole second wave and you know may june you know people were having ventilators issues or uh, you know uh, concentrators issues or just um, you know all those things uh, oxygen issues uh, where uh, of course kerala was at an advantage that way they prepared uh, but even in australia as well where you know if i speak for australia our medtech healthcare was more prominent in victoria versus new south wales new south wales was more into financial services and other kinds of sectors whereas healthcare medtech was more in victoria i mean covid explained i mean uh, uh, really exploded and both these states were vying for resources becomes a challenge where now new south wales is investing more than any other states into building reliance and self reliance within new south wales on from mrna technology all vaccines to all medtech you know they building major advanced manufacturing because what was happening uh, uh, until about 2 years back was uh, all australia was just uh, outsourcing all the I mean, all our top automotive manufacturing was all outsourced to china and uh, you know vietnam and cambodia but the the covid landscape has exposed that you need to be able to look after and one of the countries i want to call out uh, apart from israel is a country called qatar amongst the whole gcc country qatar has been you know very progressive they have invested at least to support their own local 800000 people that they've got their food value chain their supply value chain the manufacturing value chain the financial system value chain really covered as well so they were probably one of the amongst the countries i would call out that they were really progressive and they built the whole value chain uh, and 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 when disruptions like this happen i mean we are awaiting one of the largest uh, disruption which is going to happen uh, which is going to impact uh, be driven by food uh, uh, food safety food security and water resources as well and that's probably 30 40 years down the line and it's important that startups and various countries and states are prepared to build that uh, self reliance and uh, you know uh, that kind of resilience within their own markets and startups uh, will play a major role in that i believe thank you so much sir i'm sure there are a lot of questions coming from uh, our students uh, hope we will have uh, more opportunities in the future to interact with sir uh, yeah. so uh, so on that note uh, i would like to invite uh, ms elizabeth george assistant professor bdu kaushal kendra for a formal word of thanks sir elizabeth ma'am please thank you ms respected uh, dr zakaria k director dd kaushal kendra speaker of the day mr irfan malik chief executive officer and director in q innovation global sydney sri sr nayar sir academicians participants from industry other colleges faculty members and dear students actually we started this uh, international webinar series last year as uh, sir had uh, said earlier and this is the 12th international webinar in the series 
through these uh, web series, we could get an insight into various international perspectives in different domains and also to understand the emerging concepts. So moving on to my task of giving the vote of thanks, I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Zakaria K, Director, CDU Kaushal Kendra, who is a real inspiration behind shaping this concept of international web series. Thank you, sir, for being a motivational leader. On behalf of DDU Kaushal Kendra, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to Mr. Irfan Malik, Chief Executive Officer and Director, MQ Innovation Global Sydney, for promoting, uh, uh, for actually promptly accepting the invitation and uh, you gave us a real idea on how to enable the startup and innovations through incubators and showed us the Australia India scale, scale up opportunities available. Thank you so much, sir. I thank Sri Asa Nair for facilitating and supporting all our seminars. Sir, is a well wisher of our department. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to thank. Mr. Gaudi, Mr. Dilip Ibrahim, other academicians, participants from industry and other colleges for joining us in this seminar. I thank the coordinators, Dr. Renjini and Dr. Nimita for taking efforts in organizing these series of seminars. I also thank all the faculty members and students of DDO Kaushal Kendra for being a part of the seminar. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was nice to meet you and nice to hear you. We will keep Thank in you. touch with uh, We will try to associate sure. with your people locally. Definitely. And as I call out to fellow Malayalis, I'm ready for you know supporting uh, Global Malayalis. So definitely reach out to me. And also, uh, we will uh, share, as I mentioned during my presentation, an IM deck, uh, um, you know, the investment memorandum deck as a reference point that we use globally. Uh, that can be shared with uh, the students and also access to our scale up readiness and investment readiness, uh, uh, you know, uh, information pack with multiple short videos, uh, which can be leveraged. I'm happy for uh, you all to access it through our Newtopia platform. Sure, we'll do that. Okay. All right, thank you all. Uh, good night and yeah, we'll talk to you. Thank you. Bye. Good night, good night, sir. Good night. Thank you, bye.